Minority Whip Dick Durbin of Illinois. Senator Durbin, welcome back to Meet the Press. Good to be with you. Let me start uh, with the shutdown at this point. Is there any scenario you think on December 27th that reopens the government before January 3rd? Well, we've offered the president some very specific opportunities. In fact, we just voted on one several days ago, a voice vote, the unanimous voice vote to move this government forward to the first or second week of February, uh, which the president rejected after he heard the right wing criticism. So what did you make of Senator McConnell, though, recessing? I'm just trying to figure out why you guys decided to leave. And it's, it, well, everybody I, decided to leave and basically left the president here. Are you, is everybody trying to send a message, hey, this is his? Um, or, or is this McConnell saying, I'm out of this? These negotiations are between Schumer and the president, which is what Senator Toomey just said. Well, I can tell you that the president just a few days ago said he was proud uh, to author a shutdown of his own government, that he was elected to uh, be the commander in chief and chief executive. Uh, it really is in the president's hands to decide. He says it's an issue of border security. I think we know better. It's an issue of his own political insecurity. When the right wingers start screaming at him, he just backs off and dissembles in front of us. We now have reached a depth of dysfunction that I've never seen in Washington. Are you at all open to anything in between 1.6 billion and 5 billion? Well, what uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi have both told the president is uh, we're not going to build a wall, period. Uh, secondly, if you want to talk about border security, there are many things we can do. Understand we're in the depths of a drug epidemic. We see fentanyl coming across the border from Mexico into the United States and killing thousands of people. We currently are only screening one out of five cars and trucks coming across our border. Let us dramatically increase the technology there in something called a Z portal. That's the kind of investment that Democrats want to see for real border security, not some medieval wall. So it sounds like what you're saying is you'll go up in the, in the price tag. You're open to the price tag as long as it's not for the wall. Absolutely. And if you ask the experts, even in the administration, they will tell you the technology and personnel those are the things that are needed desperately and quickly. The president ought to be sitting down with us and making this border more secure by making investments. He'll have Democrats on board. So you'd give him twice the money. If none of the money goes to the wall and it all goes to what you just described, you'd probably double it and we get out of this tomorrow? I can tell you that uh, I think there's an appetite among uh, Democrats to do something sensible at the wall. Uh, for example, to stop the flow of drugs into this country and to stop the flow of weapons and laundered drug money out of this country that build these cartels in Mexico and Central America. Is DACA for the wall, uh, the compromise that was alive for a few days back in the day, uh, is that still, if the president came back and said, would you take that, I'll take that deal now. Would you have the, public, the, the support in your party to accept it? Well, I touched that hot stove back in <laughs> February, and I can tell you that uh, this president's word when it comes to these young people who are in desperate situation because he eliminated DACA, the president's word didn't stand up when we basically got down to real bargaining. The day will come and soon when the court protection of these young people and their families is going to end, we will have to face the reality of either abandoning them or working together to find a solution. Let me turn to uh, Secretary Mattis. Uh, you sent a series of tweets after the uh, news of his resignation uh, broke, and you called him um, the last adult in the room, I believe, at one point. Do you think Secretary Mattis should have stayed, um, regardless of his views, because he was supposedly the last guardrail or one of the few guardrails that, that, that some thought were in the administration? Chuck, there was something very interesting about this. I was one of uh, many senators who privately sat down with General Mattis and said, please stay, stay as long as you possibly can. We desperately need your mature voice, your patriotism in the room when this president's making life or death decisions about national security. But it obviously reached a breaking point. I thank him for his years of service in the Marines and certainly at the Department of Defense. Uh, it breaks my heart that he's going to step aside. We counted on him to be there and to stop this president from his worst impulse. I'm curious, you're, you're somebody who, uh, on policy, I'm guessing you're pleased that we're going to start seeing troops come home from Afghanistan and start seeing troops come home from Syria. Um, how do you square the president's uh, announcements about those two things? Because you've called, you've called for both in, some way, in one way or the other. 
Well, I can tell you uh, it was 17 years ago when 23 of us, 22 Democrats, one Republican, voted against the invasion of Iraq for so-called weapons of mass destruction, which never existed. I voted at the same period of time with virtually every other senator to invade Afghanistan and go after the sources of the attack on 9-11. Little did I know that I was voting for the longest war in the history of the United States and that that vote would be used as a rationalization for us to move into Syria, Africa, and places I never could have envisioned. I think the Constitution makes it clear the American people should have been making these decisions along the way. We do this by Congress and its declaration of war. We need to reassert our authority and responsibility when it comes to that in Syria, in in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and any, in any other places that have been rationalized by that vote 17 years ago. I, I, I guess so. I want to go back to the decision itself. It looks like the president um, is getting, he's setting himself, he's got his national security advisor who wants to stay longer um, than even his defense secretary did, but it was the Turkish president um, who talked him into doing this withdrawal. How does this Senate even hold the president to account over how this decision making went down? Well, ultimately, we've learned through history that it takes uh, the power of the purse strings, that Congress has the authority when it comes to appropriations to assert itself on foreign policy. We learned the hard way after decades of debate over the war in Vietnam. But first and foremost, this Congress, House and Senate, have to reach the point where we understand our constitutional authority and responsibility. I haven't seen that in a long time. And with this president, we need to do it more than ever. Does the Turkish phone call make you think the president is compromised? Yes, I do. I have to tell you that whether he's talking to Vladimir Putin or Erdogan, these autocrats uh, have him enthralled. Uh, and after a conversation, he'll make snap judgments and avoid the best advice that he could from people like General Mattis. That, to me, is the height of irresponsibility. There are thousands of Kurds who are risking their lives to help us defeat ISIS, who are now in jeopardy because of this impulsive decision by Donald Trump. Do you question his fitness for office? Well, I can tell you every day I question whether or not we can endure another two years. I, I think we can. I think this Constitution is strong. The American yeah. people are strong. But I'm hoping that my Republican colleagues will step up and join us in a okay. bipartisan effort to put this government back on track. All right. You brought up two years. Two years from now, you're going to be uh, on a ballot in Illinois in November of 2020? You made a final decision? Listen, I... I, I can tell people that I'm raising money and trying to lose some weight. That's usually the first indication that you're up for re-election. <laughs> All right. Senator Dick Durbin, Democrat from Illinois, I hope you uh, enjoy the holidays uh, and, and you and your family have a Merry Christmas. Looking forward to seeing a lot of grandkids. Thanks. You got it. Thanks very much. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and then click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.